Hey everyone, how's it going? Flight routes and the flat earth map. Sydney to Santiago flight route and distance. One of the key bits of missing information is that at the equator, a degree of longitude is the same as a degree of latitude, about 111 kilometers, but it decreases as you move closer to the North or South Pole. The distance between longitude lines gets smaller as you move towards the poles. Obvious, really, because the longitude lines converge at the poles. Now, the flight route distances are calculated using the Great Circle Route, which incorporates latitude and longitude in the formula, meaning that the latitude and longitude is integral to calculating the flight route distances. The Great Circle routes are pretty much the same as when you do a long distance measurement using Google Earth. It'll always try and find the shortest route. Remember, everyone is sure they live on a globe, so the Great Circle route must be the shortest route. We couldn't possibly live on a flat Earth and have shorter flight routes, could we? So if we fly directly east on a flat Earth following the circle around the North Pole, we would eventually get to Santiago. The flight routes the pilots take are the Great Circle route, which dips down near Antarctica. We live on a globe, so why would they question that? They believe they're flying the shortest route. As the longitude lines get closer to the pole, as we said, the distance between each longitude line gets smaller and smaller, and at a rapid rate. In fact, the plane spends most of its time in the 50th and 60th latitude. What are the lengths between the longitude lines down there? Well, at the equator, the distance between the two longitude lines is 111 kilometers per degree. At the 50th latitude line, that drops to 71 kilometers. And at the 60th latitude line, that drops to 55 kilometers. That's half the distance compared to the equator. Now, all that makes sense on a globe as the longitude lines converge down at the poles. So we can't say, for example, that a degree is always 111 kilometers like it is at the equator. Down at the 60th latitude, one degree is only 55 kilometers, half the distance of that at the equator. According to the globe's longitude lines, there would be 140 degrees difference between Sydney and Santiago. If you divide the flight distance of 11,354 kilometers by the 140 degrees, you will arrive at 81 kilometers per degree. But if you plot the actual flight route using graph paper and Google Earth as I did, you'll get 70 units of measurement on the graph paper from due east, but you get 80 for the flight route that dips down to Antarctica. So it's a, remember it's 140 degrees if the plane goes due east. You'll measure 160 for the actual flight route dipping down to Antarctica. So 70 units relating to the 140, 80 units relating to 160. So if it's 140 going due east, it's actually 160 units dipping down. So if the degrees is 140 difference, then for the flight route dipping down, they've traveled 160 degrees. If you divide the flight distance of 11,324, by the 160 degrees gives an average of 70.875 kilometers per degree. Remember, they haven't just gone due east, all right? Far from it, they've dipped right down and they've dipped an extra 20 degrees. So if you multiply the 140 degrees due east by this new 70.875 kilometers average, that'll give you 9,908 kilometers. So the due east route on a flat Earth would be 9,908 kilometers. Now, that matches up to the chord length calculation, which would be 9,889 kilometers for the straight line route, meaning we're only 9 kilometers out. By plotting the great circle routes, getting the due east degrees, and working out the chord length, we can actually easily show the flight routes listed on the globe will work for the flat Earth. Where it doesn't work is drawing straight lines on the Gleason map. The reason this map doesn't work visually like this is all to do with the longitudinal lines converging at the poles. 
This presents a serious challenge to transpose the latitude-longitude coordinates from the globe over to the flat map. But basically what happens on the Gleason map is that the northern hemisphere is accurate, but the southern hemisphere is doubling everything and pushing everything further away from each other. You can see on the Gleason map the longitudinal lines are not converging at the poles, which they must do, otherwise all of the distances would be out. You wouldn't use the same coordinate system if we were starting from scratch, but for the purpose of proving flight routes, a flat earth map that has the continents in the correct location and size and matches the globe latitude and longitude coordinates will be required. That's something that I'm working on at the moment and in the next video I'll show you the different examples of coordinate systems that, that do work. The flat earth distances I'm using are based on the globe having a circumference of 40,000 kilometres. That gives us a diameter of 12,732 kilometres which represents the North Pole to the South Pole distance in a straight line. So double that to be the entire width of a flat earth. Also, double the Earth's circumference of 40,000 kilometres to get the flat Earth's circumference of 80,000 kilometres. By the way, at the 70 degree mark, or close to the ice wall, that would make the circumference around 62,000 kilometres, which matches the figure mentioned by Captain James Ross from Ross Ice Shelf fame. Anyway, lots more to follow on this important topic.